you see on the screen, we'll start in, a, in just a couple minutes. Um, you'll also notice that I am not Dominic. Um, I am Fitz. Uh, I'm one of the other developer advocates for Temporal. Um, Dominic uh, is on vacation, so I hope he's enjoying himself and being relaxing and all of that stuff. So um, that's that's who you're talking to right now. Um, and that's we're going to just give it a couple minutes. In the meantime, um, I'm also going to put up this slide, which has a couple of things that um, just interesting little tidbits that um, we've been up to out and about at around in her, around the world. Um, so part of the reason Dominic's on vacation is because he was just at Strange Loop, uh, the Strange Loop conference, uh, presenting on durable executions. Um, uh, I believe that was recorded, so hopefully we'll uh, be able to see that for the rest of us that weren't actually there. Um, some of us got to see a, a, a pre-show of, of the presentation of the talk, uh, and, and it was really cool, and, and um, as, as Dominic's talks always are. So hopefully that's recorded and the rest of us can see all of them come, come through. Um, also, speaking of conferences, we're going to be at GopherCon in Chicago. Um, that's uh, not this coming weekend, but the weekend after that. And um, if you happen to be in the area for GopherCon, come say hi. We're going to have a booth um, and uh, we'll be out and about on the floors. And we're also having a happy hour in Chicago. Um, there's an RSVP link there uh, if you are interested in showing up for that. And um, and it's it's also on the GopherCon agenda too. It's, it's official. It's a real thing now. Um, so if you're in Chicago at GopherCon or not, come say hi. We're going to be at that happy hour um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, also, from the product side, uh, version 1.18 was released. Uh, you can click there. It was about uh, eight days ago. Um, but we've not had a meetup since then, so I thought it was worth uh, pointing out. So uh, version 1.18 was released. You can click there. Um, well, it's uh, on the releases page on the GitHub, um, temporal slash releases, and everything there is about that release. So, um, and we were also, a group of us were in Europe popping around, uh, going to user meetups, meeting with users, meeting with uh, uh, potential customers and, and lots of interest there. Um, and, and it was really great to, uh, from what I hear, I was not there, but from what I hear, it was really, really good to, to be meeting with, with people live and, and seeing people hosting, hosting meetups and hosting, hosting work for Temporal as well. And that was really, really great. Um, okay, I think we, we've got a pretty good, good quorum. Um, and so our agenda for today, um, right at five after the hour. So I've just spent some time welcoming you. Um, we're gonna talk through um, a couple things. All of our presenters uh, today are are from Temporal. Um, and, and we've got a handful of things we're going to go through. We're going to go through uh, Rob's project of XK6, and he's going to talk about that in, in just a moment. So we're going to give a, a little brief update on where, where cloud is, and then we're going to go through a demo of Temporal and Spring Boot. So, Rob, are you ready to to take the reins uh yeah let's see if i can share my screen awesome i will unshare mine uh okay can you see browser windows and such yes cool okay now i'm going to start at the end and work backwards uh so the idea of the project that I'm working on at the moment, uh, which involves the XK6 temporal thing, which uh, Fitz mentioned, is to give users an indication of uh, what kind of performance they can expect from different sizes of temporal cluster. So different node counts, instance types, uh, and specifically which kind of persistence backends they're likely to need. Uh, to, sorry. Recording in progress. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, the idea is to give users before they deploy Temporal an indication of what kind of RDS system they will need or Sandra um, in order to kind of get things 
uh, roughly in line before they deploy so that they don't have to change things later because changing the persistence on a temporal cluster is not a thing, unfortunately. You'd have to build a new cluster. So it's giving people an indication of performance um, before, before they get started. Uh, and you know, helping people understand the implications of things like shard count uh, and task queue partitions, which affect performance and can vary uh, in their importance based on the workload you're doing. So um, there's not a lot to look at yet. It's very early stages in the project. Uh, I'm still working on making uh, results repeatable and stuff. But the idea is that we're going to end up with uh, a lot more busy charts on here. Um, so at the moment, you can see there's some graphs here. Uh, VUs is a measure of how many uh, concurrent things we're throwing at uh, Temporal at once. I'm going over all this really quickly because there's a lot to cover, but if there's any questions, I'll try and answer them. Iterations is how many workflows we managed to run end to end, or rather how many workflows completed per second. Uh, and then state transitions is the way we usually measure performance of Temporal cluster, which is uh, sort of an abstraction, which uh, means that we don't have to worry too much about the design of the workflows. So um, obviously different people will have different numbers of workflows running different numbers of activities per workflow and child workflows and all that kind of stuff. So state transitions is a way to sort of measure the, the throughput of a temporal cluster without worrying specifically about the uh, design of the workflow patterns. Um, so at the moment, we're running automatically against uh, two different RDS instances uh, using an EKS cluster on Amazon. The intent is to spread this across Google Cloud Azure and all that other good stuff uh, with the sort of the relevant uh, persistence backends that those platforms offer. Um, and then Cassandra and so on later down the road uh, as we can sort of get all this stuff repeatable. Um, so at the moment, I'm just running on an M6i large and a M6i 2x large. You can see the differences here. So without any uh, cluster changes, so they're using the same shard count and task queue partition size. Uh, this is how many uh, state transitions a second they support sort of out of the box. Um, now, I can't show you the RDS graphs, unfortunately, at the moment. I'm trying to get those into Grafana so that they're more visible to people. Um, but it happens that the, the smaller database instance, we're exhausting the CPU. So it's effectively tuned as much as it can be. Uh, the large one, we only get to about 40 cent CPU. So there's a lot more room to sort of improve things uh, and get more performance out of the database there. And that's one of the things I hope to work on as part of this project is to uh, document all this stuff and sort of all the challenges that I've had trying to get these things to sort of run as as uh, best as possible uh, and how you can tell the performance of things from the graphs and then sort of tune your clusters to, to get the best out of them as well. Uh, so that's a way down the line, but that's the sort of the end intention. So this is the very high level overview of like literally the bullet points from the benchmarks that are running. Um, there's a dashboard that helps me see more details. Uh, so this is sort of variable by stack. Uh, stack is a plumy term, I'll get to that uh, in just a sec. Uh, like I said, I'm trying to go really quickly here to sort of cover lots of stuff. Uh, so these are the different uh, database backends uh, running the benchmarks, and you can flick between them to see the difference in performance. Um, this dashboard, uh, all of this is on the GitHub repo, by the way, so you can all sort of have a poke around. Um, and this dashboard will improve as sort of we as a team better learn how to present this information in a useful way for people to tune their benchmarks or tune their clusters, I should say. Um, to get the best out of them. Uh, but you can see the stuff that I'm basically uh, working through at the moment to get a feel for where the next bottleneck is to improve stuff on our clusters. So I've got things like poll sync rate and stuff, um, polling latency from the workers to the server uh, and various other metrics that I'm using. Uh, like I say, these will change as I better learn how to, you know, what metrics are useful for this and how to present things. And I'm hoping to do like thresholds as well to warn you if the benchmark that you're running the results you're getting are outside what we consider like an optimal value and perhaps give you some hints as to what you might change to fix that stuff. So this is the, the sort of the output of the whole system at the moment. Um, and this is all driven, uh, it's all done in uh, the open with the exception of the dashboards, which I'm trying to make open so that you can see the results of the, uh, the benchmarks that we're running automatically from GitHub. Um, all of the code that drives all of this is in the benchmark matrix repo. Um, so this is basically a set of Kubernetes manifest to deploy temporal uh, and some uh, Pulumi code. Pulumi is a tool, a bit like Terraform, to automatically uh, sort of build infrastructure and tear it down again. Uh, so there's Pulumi code in here, which builds an AWS environment suitable for running EKS, which is the platform that I'm targeting for the first round of this work. Uh, and then um, Beyond that, some um, 
Gloomy code, which basically pulls up temporal, pulls up some monitoring infrastructure. At the moment, all of the metrics we're sending to Grafana Cloud, so I can sort of see what's going on, and so that others will be able to see once I've made the dashboards public. Uh, and then basically deploys um, some workers and the uh, XK, XK6 temporal code, which uh, is able to run the actual benchmarks, which is JavaScript, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, so this is the project that sort of pulls everything together. Uh, it leans on two things. So one is uh, the benchmark workers. Now this is a bit similar to uh, what you'd find in a tool called Maru, which a lot of you are familiar with. So um, these are standardized workflows and activities which you can sort of wire together in different ways to sort of roughly simulate the workload that you want to run on Temporal. It's in the Go written in the Go SDK, but it, that doesn't really make any difference. Um, it could have used any of them. So this is a tool that you can use. There's a Docker image we, we can publish so you can run this in your own clusters and simulate uh, the workflows that you use without having to write the code yourself. Uh, they're kind of, um, what's the word? They're flexible. So the activities, for example, you can um, tell it how many times to repeat the, uh, the run, for example, without having to recompile the activity or anything. So these are like pre-factored pre workflows and activities that you can use to build uh, um, tests out of. And then the actual benchmarks that run uh, use a tool called uh, XK6 Temporal. Now this is a module for the K6 IO testing tool, which is written by Grafana. It's a framework a bit like uh, AB uh, from back in the day for using you know, Apache Bench for uh, stress testing Apache. Uh, so this is uh, a tool that Grafana produced now, they bought it actually. Um, and as sort of infrastructure for running stress tests, load tests, scaling up and scaling down, and that kind of thing. So we're, we're sort of leaning into that to make best use of you know, all the existing infrastructure they have. Uh, and the way we do, we do that is I bundled a temporal client into a module that the K6 tool can use, uh, which means you can write scripts like this. Uh, so just quickly run through this. This is benchmark script. This is what we're running on our uh, benchmark matrix to produce the results or very similar to. Um, so you can tell it how many uh, iterations you want to run. So how many times around the script. Uh, so it's 1,000 here, obviously, you can see 10,000, sorry. And VUs, and that's the number of, it's the equivalent to the number of uh, clients running uh, concurrently. So uh, it might be like, uh, it sounds for virtual users. So if this was testing a website, they'd represent an individual user with a browser. So here we're just running uh, 100 clients at the same time and trying to get through 1,000, uh, sorry, 10,000 iterations of this script across those uh, 100 users as quickly as we can. Uh, and this is using the benchmark workers that I mentioned before. Um, so we're basically running on a benchmark task queue. This is a standard uh, temporal client interface. Um, we're just gonna run one activity. We're gonna run it once. As you can see, these are the abstracted um, parameters that we're passing in. This activity just returns its result immediately, it doesn't actually do any work. It's just used for sort of simulating stuff. Um, and then we're going to wait until the workflow is finished and then we're going to sort of say we're done and then the next iteration can carry on. So this is how we're sort of uh, load testing the system. So in the benchmark um, code itself, we're doing a, a, a sort of slight variation on this. So in order to find the point at which the system starts to crawl, um, I'm scaling up the number of uh, concurrent users gradually. So starting at 500, and then working slowly up to a thousand and sort of leaving it at each uh, stage for about two minutes just to sort of let the metric settle. Um, but it's, it's running the same kind of test. So we start a workflow and then we sit and wait for the result. Uh, yeah, and so that all these uh, repos uh, sort of uh, banded together uh, to produce this system. Uh, it's all in the open. A lot more work to do to make it more useful. Like I say, I want to be all on different clouds. Uh, and make the results, these dashboards uh, public. At the moment, they're not published, they're internal. But I'm trying to figure out how to snapshot them as part of the GitHub Actions stuff that we run on the benchmark matrix. Uh, and lots of documentation and blog posts and so on to come to sort of uh, document our learnings and help you judge what kind of uh, persistence database you'll need ahead of time and how to tune your clusters uh, to get the best performance out of Temporal. Uh, so that was a bit of a whirlwind. I hope that wasn't too quick, um, but that's sort of a gist of what we're working on at the moment. Uh, and any questions? Did that make sense to anybody?
Um, how do we want people to ask questions? Just raise a hand and we'll unmute you. Or I, I think everyone has the ability to unmute themselves even. Yes, either, either way, if we get overlapping speaking, we'll resort to hands up. But uh, if you have questions for Rob, raise hand or unmute and go for it. You can it. also ask in the chat as well. I think that's open, isn't it? Yes, yeah. always an option as well. I I actually, I was just talking with someone uh, yesterday about metrics and like, I realized that we temporal um, don't wanna tell people what to do, but then also like when they see things on their Grafana metrics, they're like, wait, is this good? Is this bad? Should I tune? How do I tune? Do we, is this like the first step in that kind of, generic benchmark recommendation process? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I'm hoping that a lot of people will start to use bits of these tools to run their own benchmarks. Um, at the moment, they're not particularly repeatable. So one of the things I'm trying to do is make sure that people could literally clone everything and run the uh, benchmarks themselves and get the same results. And at the moment, that's not true. I'm getting different results run to run. Uh, so I've got all that kind of stuff to iron out and just make sure I understand why that's happening and you know, fix it best I can. Um, but particularly things like the benchmark workers and the, the K6 extension, I'm hoping people will start to use on their own benchmarks. You know, they, they don't need to use everything or they can pick and choose any of the bits. It should just pe uh, give people a sort of a leg up to be able to run benchmarks um, more quickly without having to write code themselves. Um, yeah, so that's the diet. And lots of documentation to follow on as we sort of better learn how this stuff all works uh, on more clusters and on different cloud providers and all that kind of stuff, and persistence backends particularly. Uh, okay, awesome. so a couple of questions from chat. So Jacob asked, do this benchmark connect to the K6 cloud offering or run independently? Uh, so they don't use the K6 cloud thing at the moment. Um, my understanding of the K6 cloud thing is that it's mainly designed to allow you to run the... Um, the client side things scaled out across their infrastructure uh, and then there's a few kind of pre-built dashboards and stuff that they provide because they're integrated with grafana there wasn't much value for that uh in a, uh, there wasn't much value for us in that because one of the things we wanted to do was try and get this as close to you know your real systems as we could so the workers are already running inside um your cluster and sort of the the latency to the between the client and the server to start the workflows isn't really relevant to anything it's not the you know it's never going to be the well severely hope it's not ever going to be the the thing that makes the most performance difference so the cloud offering for k6 didn't actually really make any difference for us um i think it'd be really useful for people running sort of heavy load tests against websites and stuff where they don't really want to have to sort of cope with that bandwidth or uh, cpu stuff but in our in, in this case it doesn't really make sense um, so the benchmarks go to Grafana Cloud, but that's not related to K6 Cloud, they're sort of different offerings. Um, uh, so here I'll ask when to run benchmark matrix versus Mario. Um, so I'm hoping to replace Mario basically with these various bits plugged in. Um, the difference is that they're split differently. So hopefully they'll be more reusable on their own. Um, but we hope to get to the point where we have a, like a wide selection of user contributed scripts that live in the the K6 repo here. Um, and because of the fact that K6 already interacts with lots of different things, uh, it should give people the, the, the ability to do sort of integration tests where Temporal is a part of it, but not the whole thing, because it already can talk to Redis and Postgres and you know, make HTTP requests and all that good stuff. Uh, there's a gRPC module as well. So I think it, uh, you know, long-term it'll give people the ability to, to run much more coherent and large-scale load testing uh, of their application as a whole, including temporal, rather than just sort of specifically at temporal, which is where Mario sits. Um, and there's a couple of little things with Mario that I, I didn't like that it used temporal to drive the load test itself because it feels a bit kind of slightly interfering with the load on temporal that you're trying to load test. Um, so the 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 K6 stuff handles that uh, itself. Um, so yeah, they're they're kind of equivalent at the moment. Um, and hopefully, you know, longer term, when I've worked on it longer and it's more feature complete and well documented, then I'd hope that the K6 extension will replace Mario for most people in combination with the pre-built workers. All right. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, 
uh, for for presenting on XK6 and all that that you're working on. Um, we've got two more presentations here, so I wanted to move on. Uh, Pierre is going to give us an update on things about the cloud. Pierre, you ready to take it away? I am. Awesome. All right. Go here. Go there. I'm assuming you can see my screen. Yes. Cool. All right. I'm just gonna jump right in. So yeah, hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Pierre Tori. I head the the product team for the for the cloud. So really excited when we get a a chance to chat with you guys. Um, wanted to give uh, like a really quick update on where we are. Uh, I have one or two slides and then oh, a couple of slides and then kind of like go into more like a, a quick demo, but just kind of like high level again, like why, you know, why, why the temporal cloud and why do we see like the value and what people are looking for? Um, the big one um, that we keep on saying is really like focus on your code, or, you know, focus on your code, don't focus on the infrastructure. And so really getting that agility that you want to have, you know, not having to learn about a lot of like the internal details uh, about the, you know, temporal server and just really focusing on workflows and, and your code. Um, especially as it gets to, you know, like hosting different use cases, hosting different application or things like that, really getting that agility over like how to use basically um, Temporal. The next one is around highly available. It's like we've, you know, built Temporal, we know how to operate it. Uh, we build it at scale, we build it in many places. And so kind of like really looking to like, uh, you know, um, get basically the availability that you need for your business application and for your production application. Um, the security is, uh, you know, is key for us. Uh, a lot of things that we are doing around security between encoding, you know, like the payload that gets to cloud to like the different feature we support or things like that. So really think about it uh, like that. And then last one, enterprise ready, uh, also leveraging feature that you want to have in, you know, in your organization, like role-based access, like, you know, access to private link or things like that. So really kind of like build for the enterprise, um, you know, so you can use it at scale. Uh, so what does it mean? Um, when you use Temporal Cloud, one of the big, big abstraction that we are using, and I think we've talked a couple of times about it, but just to stress that again, um, one of the big thing is this notion of namespace as a service. When you use Temporal today, you manage a cluster. When you use basically a self-hosted version of, of Temporal, you are familiar with the cluster, you're familiar with the server and all the different elements. Well, when we use the cloud, really the abstraction that we give is this notion of a namespace and really consuming basically this envelope where you put your workflows. <clears throat> and so we cite basically a namespace to support like 80% plus of the use cases that we have where um, I think Rob talked about state transition and we kind of like tweaked a little bit the notion of state transition to what we consider an action. Think of this like a list of some API that basically you, you interact with on, on the cloud. We kind of like scope it to 100, but if you want more, we can support a lot more than that. So it's just more like what you get by default. And then really focusing on P99 latency, giving you like, you know, um, longer retention and things like that. So those are really the primitive that we give you when you consume namespace, when you want to use this namespace and you don't have to worry about anything else. We build a cloud for scale. I mean, today we process 100 billion plus action per month, so really high number. We basically have like a target to sell of like 99.9 .9, um, that we are offering. Uh, we are available in seven AWS region. We're always thinking of adding more, um, you know, and down the road thinking of adding more cloud, really pushing on that. And really, as I mentioned earlier, like in order to build for basically like this highly available system, like we know how to operate basically the cluster across availability zones. So like just really think that even per region, we run in like at least uh, three availability zone and kind of like really build for the scale, maximize that scale so you get the most out of your of your namespace. Um, the cloud is consumption based, so it's really just pay for what you use. Again, we talked about this notion of action. Well, what are action? They are like you know starting workflows, basically starting activities. The notion of signals or timer, heartbeat queries. So those are kind of like what you use. 
Um, state transition, what we have seen is sometimes harder to map exactly to a number versus action, you kind of know what you're doing. So um, if you go on temple.io uh, uh, and on the cloud section, you can see more detail around kind of like the, the consumption and what you mean by consumption. And then we have a really simple structure uh, and then storage to talk about storage. We also have a way for you to differentiate what's like um, running workflow versus something that we're retaining and kind of like really optimize again for like your active, active state and versus kind of like, okay, you need to keep that data for compliance reason or things like that. And then we have a, you know, pricing scale automatically by volume, meaning, you know, the more you use, basically the more discounts you get. Um, so just kind of like, and all of that again is published on our website. So please feel free to have a look or reach out, you know, if you have any question around that. But again, like the key thing here is just, you know, pay only for what you use. It's easy to come in, just start testing first. And then kind of like, you know, once your application starts scaling, you just scale with it. And so we're really kind of like deeply connected with you guys for the success of your, of your application with that. So that was pretty much it. I wanted to keep it really light in terms of slide. Now, kind of like what I wanted to do is um, quickly show you guys a bit of where we are. Um, on Friday last week, we had a bit of a workshop. Um, I, I don't know if some of you guys were able to attend. I know the video should either be online or soon to be online. So um, Steve, who is heading basically our kind of like front end team, did a kind of like sort of demo of like the UI. So please go back to it. But uh, for the one that didn't, I just wanted to give you guys a quick overview, uh, you know, for a couple of minutes on where we are and what we have done. So one of the cool thing that now we have available is that you can jump between workflows, you know, kind of like what you have seen in the, in the past, you can select the namespace you want to use, you can check your namespace and everything. And now you can have like that picker across namespace, which was something we didn't support. And the reason I'm showing you that, uh, sorry, I should have like maybe started with that is we just started basically our kind of like public beta. And so anyone that has access to cloud, that has a cloud account and we're still working uh, as really fast and we've accelerated how we processing the wait list. Um, thanks so much for like all the success and you guys wanting basically, uh, you know, accounts, but uh, we're really actively working through that list. And, uh, and, but we just opened up our new public beta of a lot of like the self-service feature and this temple cloud UI. And so that's kind of like what I'm showing to you guys here. So a couple of things that are really cool to highlight. So first this namespace speaker is great, but also like now you can even create yourself your own namespace. And so that's one of the big feature that we support now is you can directly create as part of this namespace as a service, you can really go and kind of like select the you know namespace. So I'm just going to copy a certificate right here. Uh, so let's call that meetup. I don't know. We are like the 27, and then let's say we're in US West two with like. And so here you can see that we support a bunch of like different region as we talked about. I can change my retention period days. Um, so here we're going to start. I don't know. So I don't need 30 days. I'm just going to do seven here, and then I'm going to kind of like copy the certificate that we use. And there's like a bunch of docs, you know, that you can find and see how to create the certificate and manage them. In that we manage, um, you know, we can create your own certificate filters if you have more like public certificate you want to use or things like that. And also create your own custom search attributes and add them and things like that. You can decide to add users and kind of like what type of permission. I'm going to touch on user in a minute. Um, so stay tuned with me on that. But like you can say who can access your namespace or things like that. And we can just create a namespace from here. And then the really cool thing now, and it takes a little bit, you know, to kind of like for us to receive it, prepare the infrastructure with it. And then what's going to happen is like, once we do that, we do create your namespace. And here now you can see that your namespace is in progress, but you get a lot of like really cool information. Now you can see that we're going to show you like those number of action and the usage that you have over time. You can review the custom search attributes, certificates and uh, all the filters. And then from here, I can also see kind of like retention and where I'm writing and, and stuff like that. So really getting the, the feature of this namespace as a service, making it easier and easier for you guys to do it. Um, I'm going to move in. So I'm a, so we have three types of permission. We have kind of like a global admin, and then we have more like a dev type of users, and, and then we have more like read-only. But one of the things, so I'm a global admin, and now what I can do is I can also create user and add user. So it becomes really easy now to add user to your temporal account and grant them different type of permission depending on what you want. And so as I mentioned, there's this notion of global admin, the developer, or read only. 
But now you can pick and choose all of that and add directly the users and add the user to your namespaces. So really gave you um, flexibility between trying to be really highly open, which we have seen a lot and kind of like a developer should have like pretty much admin to anything permission. And so you can do that or for like larger enterprises a more regulated environment actually be a lot more like secure in some sense and say, well, okay, only one person can create a namespace, but then creating workflows and using it and stuff like that, anyone can do it. And so you can really pick and choose in terms of permission around that. So that's another cool kind of like cool features managing user and permission. We've started using integration. Uh, in terms of integration right now, we offer like a PromQL endpoint for observability. So you can start uh, pointing like your, you know, Grafana dashboard to Temporal. And we also adding more, uh, looking to add more like an API scraping endpoint or things like that. And soon to be released in the next couple of weeks, uh, more like an audit log. So you can see who has done what, where, you know, when they did it and kind of like what you would expect from like an audit log standpoint. So expect that to see um, in a couple of weeks. And then finally, um, I think kind of like the, the last really cool thing is we have a, added the data encoder, which is a really big feature for the cloud. Again, like by using data encoder, you don't need to like send us really in data. You can encrypt your payload and then that gets to the cloud. Uh, we can go into more specific detail on that in a different section, but that's, um, or session, sorry, but that's kind of like one of the key things for the cloud. Um, so yeah, so those, and then finally, the usage, we started seeing it, but kind of like being able to review, you know, all the type of um, queries that you're getting, all the type of action, you know, by namespace and start having all that visibility that you would expect. So we did a really big push, a lot of new stuff coming on the cloud. Um, we are actively processing through the wait list um, and really going faster in that one. Um, and excited to get you guys feedback and uh, happy to answer any question you guys have. Same deal as before, uh, feel free to unmute and ask um, or pop the question in the chat. And we've already got one uh, from Marco. Are we gonna have the ability to uh, add a budget so that we, when we reach a certain amount, um, Temporal stops processing and we don't risk spending a bunch of money? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't support that yet. Uh, absolutely something that we're going to evolve that kind of like usage section to do a lot more like bidding specific kind of like information. Um, we're hiding more like uh, basically that hierarchy of bidding and, and then, then being able to apply limit and things like that is going to be something that we are targeting. Uh, so absolutely like a feature that we are thinking of building. We don't have a timeline yet on that though. Awesome. Uh, Sahil has a question. Are some of these features such as usage limits gonna be brought back to the open source version? Yeah, so that's that's super important. Um, so a lot of the things that I am showing here are really based and built with basically like open source. And so a lot of those features are just bubbling up some of the information that exists. Um, and so for example, usage is like for us, if you look at some of the metrics that you have today, even in OSS, you can start bubbling up this notion of actions and that exists as well as state transition or things like that. So we're really building a lot and kind of like a framework around the cloud. But uh, the goal for us and one of the features that we are actively working on is really being able to like, you know, migrate your workflow from self-hosted to cloud and back because we really see that as being like an important part of like temporal, like our commitment to open source and our commitment to kind of like make you guys successful, no matter if you decide <laughs> to use a self-hosted version of a cloud version. And so one of the big feature that we're really thinking is that like allowing you to migrate between self-hosted to cloud and back. So you can really have that feeling that, hey, decide what's the best for you. We want to be the best place for you to run your temple application, but you might decide otherwise. And then not feeling that you're locked in or anything like that is really important to us. Cool. Feel free, uh, free to ping me if there's yeah more question. There, um, we've got two um, potentially quick ones uh, in the chat. Um, Will there be a free tier possibly down the road? 
yeah, um, absolutely something that we are kind of like. So the first version, as you guys know, we have right now still more like a waitlist process and a lot of uh, that. So we're processing through that backlog of so many people that want it. And then absolutely like, one of the things that we have done is first adding those self-serve feature in the UI and then kind of like what we treat really like this account sign up and making the account sign up a lot more easier so you can have a free tier and things like that is absolutely one of our top, top, top priority. And then the last question before we before we move on, are the new UI features part of, going to be part of the uh, UI server version 2.6.2? No, so like those uh, right now are really for the cloud. Um, I don't know if we have Steve. I think he talks about it in during the meetup on kind of like oh, the workshop that we did last week. Um, but those are really kind of like uh, cloud UI that we have built. And uh, I don't believe that they're going to go into the web UI server. That is correct. Um, I can confirm that. You know, this stuff that you're seeing right now, screen shared, that there's no at least current active intention to bring those to the self-hosted uh, UI. Um, that being said, Pierre did um, mention that all of the metrics and all the data that you can um, use to visualize this stuff is available to you as a self-hosted user. So um, that's definitely something that um, you could build out and it's capable already today. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I think given, given time, I think I, I want to move on to Tio, but, uh, Pierre, if you have time, there's another question in the, in the chat. Um, if you want to take, take it yeah, over. In the, I can, in the yeah, chat. yeah, I can monitor the chat while we're moving on. And then also like guys, like, you know, we are available on the Slack channel or feel free to reach out to us. Um, so yeah, bring any of your question. Awesome. Um, there was also uh, a couple of times mentioned a, a workshop last week that happened. Lots of interesting information from from Steve that was recorded and um, we're post processing it um, before before publishing it. So um, stay tuned on all the usual channels uh, for for seeing when when that gets posted. But it was recorded. It will be posted. So if you weren't there, you haven't missed out yet because it will come up again in the future. Um, so cloud is exciting. Um, I know the question is when can I get access to it? As mentioned, we're working through it as fast as we can. Um, so uh, hopefully you're up soon in whatever that list is. Okay, so next up, um, our last presentation of the day is Tio is going to be um, going to give us a demo of Spring Boot and how that work is coming along. Um, Tio, are you, you're unmuted, you're here. You ready to take over? Yeah, yeah, sure, thank you. Awesome, it's all yours. I'll share my screen. All right, so hi everybody. Thanks for joining and having me here. Uh, before I start, I just wanna do my usual plug is uh, if you guys have any questions, this is particularly for OSS. We do have our community.temporal.io, so make sure you go there. And if you have any questions after the meeting or whatever, feel free to also ask it here. And uh, we are all going to make sure um, to, to get your question and answer it. Now, uh, for what I'm going to talk about is uh, temporal integration with... Uh, Spring Boot, this has been a long time coming. We have a lot of users in the community as, as, you know, that, that have been trying to integrate Temporal with Spring Boot. And Spring Boot, you know, being a Java framework is a very popular framework for kind of developing uh, microservices in, 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 in Java. And since uh, SDK, Temporal Java SDK uh, 1.16.0, we have added... <laughs> Uh, Spring Boot uh, support uh, that comes out of the box. It is still in kind of experimental alpha stage, but we've been working with it, testing it out, and, and more features are going to come in. Um, and just to show you, this is the temporal Java SDK repository um, under here, Spring Boot auto, uh, auto configuration package or module you can... Um, you have a really nice README that goes through some of the things. And, and, and we're actually going to showcase every single, well, almost every single feature that's currently already available as, as, as part um, of the demo. Now, the code and the demo that I've been showing that we'll be showing today is all on GitHub. And maybe I'll share this in the chat. 
as well. Uh, but you can, you know, after the meeting or whenever you feel like it, uh, go here and it's got a really nice step through. Uh, as far as the readme goes, you can follow every single thing that we're going to be doing today um, and run it yourself. So this is nothing that, you know, we're kind of showing that you cannot run. Um, anyway, so so kind of to get started, I'm going to show some code. Typically, you know, when you start using Spring Boot, one of the very important things is this thing called application of the properties file. And this is kind of like the Spring Boot configuration file. You can write it in YAML. And in this case, we just use the properties version of it. And the first thing that usually you have to do when you start with Temporal and pretty much any SDK is to do things like define your um, client or uh, the the uh, thing that connects to the temporal instance. Um, usually it's a lot of code involved with that and you have to manage it and stuff like that. So one of the things with Spring Boot that the, the temporal SDK does now is allows you to uh, configure your client information via properties. And in this case, and I'll make it a little bigger, uh, I'm connecting to my uh, local server or temporal service right now. Uh, however, you can connect to whatever you have going on via properties. Another thing is like the namespace itself. Um, you can also configure the namespace that you want to use uh, via properties. And then, okay, fine. But now we're actually going to come to some of the cool things. And one of the cool things with the with this is this auto discovery of workflows and activities. Typically, you have to... Um, in your in your in your code and again regardless of the sdk define your workers um, you have to uh, register all your workers and the activities uh workflows and the activities with these workers and things like that um the temporal uh java sdk spring boot <clears throat> integration allows you to auto configure auto discover these so you can either define, as I do here, a specific package, so com temporal, which corresponds on the left-hand side to my com temporal package. And uh, what this will do is go through this package and scan it uh, on the startup of your application and find all the workflow implementations and activity implementations, create the worker for you, and 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 I'll show you. You know, we will we'll see how that works and auto register of the workflows and the activities for specific task queues uh they we also are going to configure here uh it's all that is plugged in for you so you just have to now also another thing is if you don't want auto discovery you also have the option to uh specify this mapping uh directly so for example here we have a, a one task queue and then we can define uh, our own workflow implementations um uh, that are going to be registered in a worker that's auto created for you for this particular task. Um, other cool things that you can define here is, is one of the things that was always hard to do, and, and it's like, it, I guess, regardless of the SDK is, is SDK metrics. And typically you have to stand up some sort of either small scale HTTP server or some sort of application where you can push the SDK metrics to that, then you can scrape later on with <clears throat> Prometheus in this case. So again, uh, with this Spring Boot integration, you can basically just configure your management endpoint and you have SDK metrics out of the box. Um, and, and we'll show that as well. Another thing is open tracing is, oh, well, like, I think this uses Spring Boot Actuator for this. So there is native integration with Spring Boot here. And for tracing, you can uh, define, again, using Spring Sleuth in this case, you can define your tracing configuration and you have basically tracing out of the box. You just have to <clears throat> configure that on your other endpoint. So anyways, that's for that. One of the and other things is, is I wanted to show for this demo is basically uh, we said we have auto discovery of workflows. Now, when we define a workflow, and again, this is Java, we still have our typical workflow interface with the one annotation that you probably all know if you're using the Java SK, SDK, which is the at workflow interface annotation. This is basically the, the blueprint of our uh, workflow definition. And we see here we have still workflow method, uh, signal method, and query method that never changes. One of the things that is added within, uh, and it goes along with the auto discovery of your workflows and activities, 
is in the actual workflow implementation. There is a new uh, little annotation called at workflow impo. And this is an annotation that's specific to the Spring Boot integration. And here you can, as a parameter, define one or more task queues that this particular workflow should be running on. So if you define one task queue like we do here is called demo task queue, uh, the inter Spring Boot integration is going to generate a worker for you, and it's going to uh, um, have this worker listen on this uh, task queue that we define, and is going to auto-register this particular workflow implementation with the worker. Similar for activities, uh, as we've had before, we have the app activity interface, which is you know what you would is currently already there, and you have to use and. Uh, but for activity implementations, and then the first thing you can make it at component. So you can auto wire it into wherever you need if you needed this. Uh, however, there is a new, a similar to uh, workflow input, there is now an activity input uh, annotation where again you can specify a task queue for this particular activity. So give again, you can define one or more. And for each, uh, you will have either, you know, a workflow worker with uh, or activity worker if you run this on a specific activity task queue that is going to be generated for you and this activity is going to be registered activity implementation uh, is going to be registered um in 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 this worker the third thing i wanted to do is so it's not only auto discovery of workflows and activities but one thing that's already currently available is auto discovery of data converters. So here, for example, as part of the demo, we have this thing called a cloud events payload converter. So in our demo, we will see we're sending events to our workflow executions and cloud events is a CNCF project and it's you know very popular widely used and it defines a standard uh, for format of, of the events that we're going to send to our workflow execution and also work is going to return as part of the response. Now, typically we have a lot of, you know, number of lines of configuration code that we have to uh, define in order for, um, to use custom uh, payload converters within the Java SDK, but with this auto discovery, all we have to do is write a add configuration. This is the typical Spring Boot thing. And we define a bean here uh, that returns a type data converter. And that's it. This uh, data converter is then going to be auto discovered and is going to be registered for you um, for all of the workers that uh, are also <laughs> generated based on the auto discovery of your workflows and activities. Um, yeah, so I think these are some of the major parts. Um, the code is is pretty kind of uh, interesting as it fits very well within the the framework or that being Spring Boot used. Um, and of course, the last thing, and then we'll jump to the demo, is testing. Um, you can write whoops, uh, test that use at Spring Boot test. Um, <clears throat> and you can also, and I'm you know there is a little things that we're improving right now but the cool thing about when uh, out of the box that you get when you're writing your tests that being integration tests or or unit tests that you might have for your workflows or if you want to you know write your activity tests you can do it the quote-unquote spring boot way uh, in addition you don't have to configure your test workflow environment uh, same auto discovery of uh, workflows and activities that happen um, just for when you run your application on the same way, uh, th uh, those are also going to be registered to your test workflow environment. So you no longer have to do, deal with that either. And I know you, you can also auto wire the workflow client here, which means it's just going to be injected an instance of your workflow client and you can use to start, uh, for example, your workflow executions uh, async um, in your tests. All right. So I think that so far as far as go oh yeah just wanted to show really really quick what our workflow actually does uh the workflow that we're going to run in the demo and is going to basically be very simple it's going to receive a cloud event or an event when it starts so when we started we're going to pass a cloud event to it and then basically it's going to run some activities just to show that we can 
and it's going to hit a workflow that await, which is a block in sleep until this uh, particular uh, condition is evaluated to true. Uh, so basically our demo, we're gonna start our workflow execution, and then we have to signal it with the second event in order for it to complete. So that's pretty much it. And we also have a signal method to send the cloud event, um, the second cl cloud event is a signal. And then we have a query method that just returns us the last send event to this particular workflow execution. All right, so now to the fun part. Uh, again, this demo is all on GitHub. Uh, when you follow these instructions and, and start things up, you can start it up on localhost 3030 in this case. And this is basically just a little web thing uh, just to kind of show uh, what you can do. Uh, one thing is uh, you have a little thing here that shows your cluster information. This is just shows what I'm running. I'm running on 117.5, I'm not on latest, and I have some persistence and visibility stores running on Postgres. Now this all uses the Java SDK uh, client APIs uh, to retrieve, and you can do this with ECTL or your SDKs, so any of the SDKs in Temporal um, as well. Now we see here that we have a list of workflow executions. Currently we have nothing running. So let's go ahead and start something. Now, this little form here has this thing called workflow type. Uh, in every single SDK, uh, it's either the name of the function or, or things like that. With Java SDK, just to show you, the workflow type is by default the name of the workflow interface. So let's get, we want to uh, execute our demo workflow. The task queue that we're going to execute this particular workflow on, we can get, again, just from configuration here, it's called demo task queue. And we can get, just give it, let's say, a demo one, two, three workflow ID. So we do want to give a business ID. And now we want to give it some JSON input. This input, as we said, has to be in cloud events format. So thankfully, I have a little cheat here that I can copy and paste this particular JSON here. So this is just going to send a cloud event uh, as input or workflow execution with some unique ID. And the payload is going to be just first and last name. When we start our execution, we see here that we do have an execution running <laughs> on our temporal service. Uh, it's currently in running status. And you know this is ugly, but you can see the workflow history here. It's currently, uh, uh, the last event is workflow task completed, in which case this usually means that one of the things is that we're <laughs> stuck on an await. And as we've seen in our workflow uh, definition, we're currently on line 39, waiting for our second event to come in in order to continue uh, the execution of this particular workflow. So let's go ahead and signal it. Now, for this thing, in order to signal a workflow, we have to know the signal name. And again, we can get that from our uh, workflow uh, definition. And in this case, the signal name is called add event. So let's go ahead and give it the name. And I guess as input, I'm gonna take my cheat sheet again. And let's say we want to send an event, a cloud event with let's say one, two, four is our unique ID right now. And let's say give it a different first name. So what we're doing now, when we click signal, this is going to use uh, the Java um, client APIs to send this particular signal to our currently running workflow execution. So if we see here now uh, our workflow execution demo one, two, three is in completed status. And so we have completed our workflow execution. Now, one cool thing that we can do is we also said our workflow had a query method. So let's go ahead and try to query. We said that the particular query that we can again get from our, uh, by default is the name of the query method. And of course you can change that, right? You can give it a different name if you want, that's fine. Uh, but it's called get last event. And when we uh, query this particular workflow execution, we're gonna get the last event uh, that this particular, now, you can query closed or completed workflows. And again, up to like, you know, namespace retention period set and things like that. But with Temporal, you can definitely query already completed executions. And in this case, we're going to get our one to four event, which was the last event that was sent to this particular execution while, you know, while it was running. Um, that's fine. 
another thing that you can do is with closed workflows and temporal is get the results. So here there's uh, something like this too, is for example, uh, if we our workflow completed, so with temporal, when a workflow completes, its results are recorded in the workflow history. So again, even if it's a closed workflow execution, you can query it up to retention. I mean, get that up to retention. So in here, we see the results of our workflow execution, which is also in cloud, a cloud event. It has an, a unique ID and it's data. Uh, it's a, okay, it's got, this one has data content type, but our payload of the event is basically the list of events that this workflow has received, which in this case is the ID one, two, three, which was the first event we sent and the one to four with, with, with the one that we signaled. And we have some outcome, uh, which our workflow execution has said done. All right, so that's it for the demo. Now, the, there is more, right? We said that we have, uh, okay, I'll show that again in our application of properties, we actually configured our SDK metrics. So out of the box, if you have, for example, Grafana running, you can um, go to your SDK metrics and we can see here on the right side, these, this is the workflow that we've executed and you can get SDK metrics um, out of the box. Um, and, and there is some, you know, dashboards that, that we, you know, again, things are improving as they go, but um, that's all it really takes to get SDK. It makes it much simpler in my opinion. Another thing that we said is the integration with tracing. So open tracing. And for this, I have on my local Docker, I have Jaeger running. And just to show you, we do have here two files as far as, um, whoops, not update, sorry. Um, that you can use if you don't want to run the Docker that's in here. You have uh, uh, an example how to configure your Jaeger service and hotel collector. And also same thing for, um, here for hotel config, it shows we have a sample that you can use that works out of the box for this demo if you don't want to use the Docker Compose here. But anyway, so I have Jaeger running uh, locally here and we can check our traces. Now we have one service here running called Temporal Demo. If we go back our code, this corresponds to our spring application name that we have configured in our application properties. And operations, we have a number of operations. This web UI does has a number of HTTP posts and gets like that. But one thing that we can do is um, select the operation run workflow, which is the demo workflow that we have uh, just ran in the demo. And we have the HTTP post request that actually is responsible in our to, 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 to initiate this. And when you click on it, you can see all the traces for the overall workflow execution. And you can see a couple of the activities as well that were executed um, during workflow execution. Okay, so yeah, so again, uh, temporal Java SDK, uh, Spring Boot auto config alpha uh, module. And 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 yeah, that's, a, that's all I have. I, if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tio. Uh, we're almost right at time. So um, fortunately, most of the questions uh, Dimitri and Maxim have taken care of in the chat, oh, awesome. um, which yeah. is awesome. We've got it all taken care of uh, for the most part there. But in the last minute or two, if anyone has any any questions, um, I guess I'll, I'll put up my obligatory uh, we're at this stage of the meetup. Um, Q and A, uh, if you have any, please ask them right in the next 20 seconds. Um, otherwise you can find us always on the Slack. You can find us on the community forums. Um, we will share the recordings. Um, it has been recorded and, and we'll post process that as usual and get it up um, when we can. So we ask, we'll, we'll have the recordings. In the meantime, thank you so much for being with us this morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time of the world it is. Um, Thank you very much, everyone.